Hello, everyone. We are working on the ninth PowerPoint today. This is a literature of Jean Jacques Rousseau. Jacques Rousseau was born in June 28, 1712, Genova, Switzerland, died July 2nd, 1778, in Moraville, France. Notable ideas, general will, human nature, popular sovereignty, more. Spouse was Tris Levesure, 1768 to 1778. Parents, was Isaac Rousseau, Suzanne Bernard Rousseau, and the place was Plegamelan. Jean Jacques Rousseau, a Swiss born French philosopher. Jean Jacques Rousseau, born June 28, 1712, Genova, Switzerland, died July 2nd, 1778, in Maryville, France. Swiss born philosopher, writer, and political theorist whose treaties and novels inspired the leaders of the French Revolution and Romantic Generation. Rousseau was least academic of the modern philosophers and in many ways was most influential. His thought marked the end of the European enlightenment, the age of reason. He propelled political and ethical thinking into new channels. His reforms revolutionized taste, first in music and then in other arts. He had profound impact on people's way of life. He taught parents to take a new interest in their children and to educate them differently. He furthered their expression of emotion rather than polite restraint in friendship and love. He introduced the cult of religious sentiment among people who had discarded religious dogma. He opened people's lives to the beauty of nature and he made liberty an object of almost universal aspiration. Formative years. Rousseau's mother died in childbirth and he was brought up by his father who taught him to believe in the city of his birth was a republic as splendid as Sparta or ancient Rome. Rousseau Sr. had an equally glorious image of his own importance after marrying above his modest station as a watchmaker. He got into trouble with civil authorities by brandishing a sword in his upper class pretentious prompt him to wear as he had to leave Genova to avoid imprisonment. Rousseau, the son, then lived six years as a poor relation to his mother's family, patronized and humiliated, lived six years as a poor relation to his mother, patronized and humiliated, until he too, at the age of 16, fled Genova to live the life of adventurer and Roman Catholic convert in the kingdoms of Sardinia and France. Rousseau was fortunate in finding in the providence of Save a beneficiary, the Barnes de Warrens, who provided him with a refuge in her home and employed him as her steward. She also furthered his education to a degree that the boy who had arrived on the doorstep as a stammering apprentice who had never been to school developed into a philosopher, a scholar, and a musician. Emmy de Warrens, who thus transferred adventurer into philosopher, was herself adventurous, a swift convert to Catholicism who had stripped her husband of his money before fleeing the savvy with the gardener's son to set herself up as a Catholic missionary, specializing in the conversion of young male Protestants. Her morals distressed Rousseau, even when he became her lover, but she was a woman of taste, intelligence, and energy, who brought out Rousseau just as the talents that were needed to conquer Paris at the time when Voltaire had made radical ideas fashionable. Rousseau reached Paris when he was about 30, and he was lucky enough to meet another young man from a providence seeking literacy fame in the capital, Denis Diderot. 
The two soon became immersely successful as a center of group of intellectual or philosophies who gathered around great French Encyclopedia of Detroit was appointed editor. The encyclopedia was an important organ of radical and antithetical opinion, and its contributors were very much reforming and even iconostic pamphleters. As they were philosophers, Rousseau, the most original of them all, was thinking and most forceful and eloquent in his style of writing, was soon also most conspicuous. He wrote music as well as prose. And one of his operas, Le Devin du Village, 1752, the Village Soothsayer, attracted so much admiration from the King Louis VI that the court had might have enjoyed an easy life as a fashionable composer. But something as Calvinist blood rejected that type of worthy glory. Indeed, at the age of 37, Rousseau had what he called illumination while walking into Venetius to visit Detroit, who had been imprisoned there because of his irreligious writings. In Confessions 1782 to 89, which he wrote late in life, Rousseau says that it came to him when a terrible flash that modern progress had corrupted people instead of improving them. He went on to write his first important work, a prize essay, for the Academy of Dijon, entitled The Source Sous les Sciences et les Arts, 1750, a discourse on the sciences and arts, in which he argues that the history of human life on earth has been a history of decay. That work by no means Rousseau's best piece of writing, but his central theme was to inform almost everything else he wrote. Throughout his life, he kept returning to the thought that people are good by nature, but have been corrupted by society and civilization. He did not mean to suggest that society and civilization are inherently bad, but rather that both had taken a wrong direction and became more harmful as they became more sophisticated. That idea in itself is not unfamiliar in Rousseau's time. Many Roman Catholic writers, for example, deplore the direction that European culture had taken since Middle Ages. They share the hostility toward progress that Rousseau had expressed. What they did not share was his belief that people are naturally good. It was, however, just that belief that Rousseau made the cornerstone of his argument. Rousseau may have well have received the inspiration for that belief from Amy de Warris, for although she had become a communist of the Roman Catholic Church, she retained and transmitted to Rousseau much of the sentimental optimism about human purity that she herself absorbed as a child from the mystical Protestant Pites, who were her teachers in Canton of Bern. At all events, the idea of human goodness, as Rousseau developed it, set him apart from both conservatives and radicals. Even so, for several years after the publication of his first discourse, he remained a close collaborator in Detroit's essentially progressive enterprise, the Encyclopedia, an active contributor of its pages. His speciality was music, and it was the sphere that first established his influences as a reformer. Controversy with Ramu, the rival of Italian opera company in Paris in 1752 to the performed works of opera Buffa, comic opera by Giovanni Bassettia Regolarsi and Alessandro Scarletti, Leonardo da Vinci and other such composers suddenly divided the French music loving public into two excited camps supporters and the new italian opera and supporters of the traditional french opera the philosophies of the encyclopedia being lee ron albert detroit and paul henry dendrich baron d halbach among them entered the fray of champions of italian music but Rousseau, who had arranged for the publication of Pagolazari's music in Paris, 
who knew more about the subject than most Frenchmen after the months he had spent visiting the opera house's events. During his time as secretary to the French ambassador to the Dogny in 1743 to 44, emerged as the most forceful and effective combiant. He was the only one to direct his fire squarely at the leading living exponent of French operatic music, Jean Philippe Ramusio. Russo and Ramusso must have been at that time seemed invently matched in the controversy about music. Ramusso already in his seventh year was not only a prolific and successful composer, but also as an author of celebrated Tare de Hamarzi, 1722 Treasy and Harmony and other technical works. Europe leading musicologist Rousseau, by contrast, was 30 years younger, a newcomer to music with no professional training and only one successful opera to his credit. His scheme for the new motion for the music had been rejected by the Academy of Sciences. And most of his music entries for Detroit Encyclopedia were yet unpublished. That dispute was not only musical, but also philosophical and Ramuso was confronted with more formidable adversary than he had realized. Rousseau built his case on superiority of Italian music over French in the principle that melody must have priority over harmony. Whereas Ramuso based his on the assertion of harmony must have priority over melody. By pleading for melody, Rousseau introduced that later came as recognized as characteristic idea of romanticism, namely the art of free expression and creative spirit is more important than strict adherence to formal rules to tradition procedures. By pleading for harmony, Rousseau affirmated the first principle of French classicism, namely that conformity to rationality and table rules as necessary conditions of art the aim at which to impose order on the chaos of human experience. In music, Rousseau was a liberator. He argued for freedom in music. He appointed to the Italian composers as models to be followed. In doing so, he had more success than Ramuso. He changed people's attitudes. Christoph Wilmberg Gunk had succeeded to Ramuso, to the most important operatic composer in France, acknowledge his debt to Rousseau's teaching, and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart became the text for his one-act operetta, Bastantine and Bassin, Bastin, Bastin and Rousseau's Les Davine du Village. European music had taken new direction, but Rousseau himself composed no more operas. Despite the success of Lee Devon Du Village, or rather because of his success, Rousseau felt that as a moralist who had decided to make break with worldly values, he could not allow himself to go on working for the theater. He decided to devote his energies, therefore, to the literature and philosophy. Major works of political philosophy of Jean uh, Jackie's Rousseau. As part of Rousseau calls reform or improvement of his own character, he began to look back at some of the astro principles that had been learned as a child in the Calvinist Republic of Geneva. Indeed, he decided to return to that city, reducate Catholicism, and seek remission of the Protestant church. He had the meantime acquired a mistress, an illiterate laundry maid named Therese, Lavashur. To the surprise of his friends, he took her to his to Geneva, presented her as a nurse. Although her presence caused some rumory, Rousseau was remedily easily to the shamanist communion. His literary fame having made him very welcome to the city that prided itself on much culture as on morals. Rousseau had by the time completed a second discourse in response to the question set by Academy of Dijon. What is the origin of inequality among men and it justified by natural law? In response to the challenge, he produced a masterpiece of selective anthropology. The argument followed that of his first discourse by developing a proportion proposition that people are naturally good and then tracing the successive stages by which they have descended from primitive innocence to corrupt sophistication. 
Rousseau begins his discourse sur original in 1755, discourse the original inequality by disguising two kinds of inequality, natural and artificial. The first arising from differences in strength, intelligence, and so forth. The second from conversations that govern societies. It is the eloquences of the later sort that set out to explain. Adopting what he thought was properly scientific methods on in investigating origins, he attempts to reconstruct the earliest phrases of his human life. He suggests that original humans were not social beings, but entirely solitary, and that the extent he agrees with Thomas Hobbes' account of the state of nature. But in contrast to the English pessimist view that human life in such a condition must have been poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Rousseau claims that original humans, although admittedly solitary, were healthy, happy, good, and free. And human vices, he argued, date from the time when societies were formed. Rousseau thus exonerates nature and blames society. He says that passions that generate vices hardly existed in the state of nature, but began to develop soon as people formed societies. He goes on to suggest the society started when people built their first huts. A development facilitated prohibition of males and females, and that in turn produced the habit of living as a family and associating with neighbors. That nascent society, as Rousseau calls it, was good while it lasted. It was indeed a golden age of human history. Only it not endure. With the tender passion for love, there was also born destructive passion of jealousy. Neighbors started to compare their abilities and achievements with one another, and that marked the first step toward inequality and the same time toward vice. People started to demand consideration and respect. Their innocent self-love turned into culpable pride as each person wanted to do better than everyone else. The introduction of property marked a further step toward inequality since it made a law and government necessary as means of protecting it. Rousseau laminates fatal concept of pro property in one of his more eloquent passages describing the horrors that have resulted from departure of a condition in which earth belonged to no one. These passages in the second discourse excited later revolutionaries such as Karl Marx and Valdemar Lyrich Lenin, but Rousseau himself did not think that the past could be undone in any way. There was no point in dreaming of a return of the golden age. Civil society, as Rousseau describes it, comes into being to serve two purposes, to provide peace for everyone and to ensure the right to property for anyone lucky to have possessions. It is thus of some advantage to everyone, but mostly to the advantage of the rich since it transforms de facto ownership into rightful ownership and keeps the poor disposed. It is somewhat fraudulent social contract that introduces government since the poor get much less of it than the rich get. Even so, the rich are no happier in civil society than they are poor because people in society are never satisfied. Society leads people to hate one another to the extent of their own interest conflict, and it's best that they're able to do this to hide their hostility behind the mask of curiosity. Thus, Rousseau regards inequality not as a separate problem, but as one of the features of the long process by which human beings become alienated from nature and from innocence. In the de dedication, Rousseau wrote a second discourse in order to present it to the public of Geneva. He nevertheless praised the city-state for having achieved the ideal balance between inequality with the nature established among men and the equality which they instituted among themselves. The arrangement he discerned in Geneva was one of the best persons, was chosen by citizens and put in the highest position of authority. Like Plato, Rousseau always believed that the just society was one in which all people were in their proper place. And having written the second discourse to explain how people had lost their ability in the past, he went on to write another book, Do Contract Social, The Social Contract, to suggest how they might recover their liberty in the future. Again, Geneva was a model, not Geneva. It had become in 1754 when Geneva returned there to recover the rights as a citizen, but Geneva as it once been, Geneva as Calvin had designed it. The social contract begins with sensational opening sentence. Man is born free and everyone he is in chains. 
and proceeds to argue that people need not be in chains. If a civil society or state could be based on genuine social contract as opposed by a fraudulent social contract depicted in the discourse of the origin of inequality, people would receive exchange for their independence, a better kind of freedom, namely true political or Republican liberty, such as liberties to be found in the obedience to the self-imposed law. Rousseau's definition of political liberty raises an obvious problem for while it can be readily agreed that individuals are free if they obey only rules they prescribe for themselves, this is because each individual is a person with a single will, society by contrast. This is that a person set of individual worlds and conflict between separate wills is a fact of universal experience. Rousseau's response to the problem is to define civil society as artificial person united by a general will to invul in generally. The social contract that brings society into being is pledged and society remains in being a pledged group. Rousseau's Republic is the creation of general will, a will that never falters in each and every member to further the public common and national interest, even though it may conflict at times with personal interest. Rousseau sounds much like Hobbes when he says that under the pact of which he enters civil society, people totally alienate themselves and with all their rights to the whole community. Rousseau, however, represents this act from the form of the exchange of the property, whereby people give up natural rights in return for the civil rights. And the bargain is a good one because that is surrounded by the rights of dubious value, who realization depends solely on the individual's own might. And what is obtained in the return or the rights that are both legitimate and enforced by collective force in the community. There's no more haunting paragraph in the social contract than that which Rousseau speaks of forcing a man to be free. But it would be wrong to interpret these words in the manner of those critics who see Rousseau as a prophet of modern politicarianism. He does not claim that the whole society can be forced to be free, but only that occasional individuals who are enslaved by their passions to the extent of disobeying the law can be restored by force to obedience to the voice of the general will exist inside of them. Persons who are coerced by the society of, for the breach of the law are, in Rousseau's view, being brought back to awareness of their own true interest. For Rousseau, there is a radical dichotomy between the true law and the actual law. Actual law, which is described in the discourse in the origin of equality, simply protect the status quo. True law as described in the social contract is a just law, and that ensures that being just is just as made by people in their collective capacity as sovereign and obeyed the same people in the individual capabilities as subjects. Rousseau is confident that such a law should not be unjust because it is unconvincible that people would make unjust laws for itself. Rousseau is, however, troubled by the fact the majority of people does not necessarily represent the most intelligent citizens. And he agrees that Plato, that most people are stupid. Thus the general will, while always morally sound, is sometimes mistaken. Hence Rousseau suggests that people need a lawgiver, a great mind like Solon or Legresis or Calvin to draw a constitution and a system of laws. He even suggests that such lawgivers need to claim divine inspiration in order to pursue the dim-witted multitude to accept and endorse the laws suffered. By the year 1762, however, when the social contract was a, a, a published, Rousseau had given up the thought of the settling in Geneva. After recovering the citizens' right in 1754, he had returned to Paris in the company of his friends around the encyclopedia, but became increasingly ill at the end of each worldly society and began to quarrel with the flu philosophies. <laughs> An article in Encyclopedia as a subject of Geneva, written by de Clamara in Valte's investigation, upset Rousseau partly by suggesting that the pastors of the city had lapsed from Calvinistic serenity and Unitarian laxity and partly imposing that the theater should be eradicated then. Rousseau hastened into the print with the defense of the chauvinist authority of the pastors with the elaborate attack on the theater as an institution that could do no harm in the innocent community such as Geneva.
years of seclusion and exile from Jean Jacques Rousseau. By the time the letter, Le, letter de Lambert sur la spectalise, 1758, letter to Missouri, D'Albert on the theater, appeared in print, Rousseau had already left Paris to pursue a life closer to nature to the country estate of his friend, Me Epony near Montgomery. When his, the hospitality of Emmy Abre proved until much the same round as that of Paris, Rousseau retreated to a nearby cottage called Melaris under the protection of Marco de Lazenberg. But even the highly paced friend could not save him in 1762 when his treasure Emily Lou Education, Emily or on Education, was published and sc scandalized the previous Genesis of the French parliaments, even the social contract scandalized the Calvinists of Geneva, in Paris as Geneva, they ordered the book to be burned and the author arrested. All of Martel de Luxembourg could do was to provide a carriage for Rousseau to escape from France. After formally renouncing his Genevan citizenship to 1763, Rousseau became a fugitive, spending the rest of his life moving from one refuge to another. The years of Montgomery had been the most productive of his literary career. The social contract, Emily and Julie, Ola Novali, Helzo, 1761, Julie or the New Eloise came out within 12 months and all three works of seminal importance. The New Eloise being a novel, escaped censorship to which the other works were subject. Indeed, all the books proved to be the most widely read and the most universally praised of his lifetime. It depends the romanticism that already formed his writings on music and perhaps did than any other work of literature to influence the spirit of the age and made the author at least at many friends among the public reading, especially among the educated women as social contract and Emily made enemies against magistrates and priests. If it did not exempt him from persecution, at least it ensured his persecution was observed and admiring from us, Du Monte intervened from time to time to help him. So Rousseau was never unlike Voltaire and Duvart, actually imprisoned. The theme of the new Eloise provides a striking contrast to that of social contract. It's about people finding happiness in domestic as distinct from public life, in the family as opposed to the state. The central character, St. Paulus, a middle-class preceptor who falls in love with upper-class pupil, Julie, she returns his love and yields his advances, but the difference between their classes makes marriage between them impossible. Baron de Estrange, Julie's father, is indeed promised to her a fellow nobleman named Wolomar. As a doubtful daughter, Julie marries Wolomar, and St. Pris goes off to the voyage around the world with the English aristocrat Bombstan, from whom he acquires certain asceticism. Julie is the season for getting her feelings for St. Barbish and finds happiness as a wife, mother, and chanteline. Then six years later, later St. Chris returns his travels and engages a tutor to the Walmart children. All live together in harmony. And there's a faint echoes in the old affair between St. Prex and Julie. The little community dominated by Julie illustrates one of Rousseau's political principles that while men should rule the world in public life, women should rule men in private life. At the end of the new Eloise, when Julie has made herself an attempt to rescue one of her children from drowning, she comes face to face with the truth about herself, that her love for St. Prex has never died. The novel was clearly inspired by Rousseau's own curious relationship at once passionate and platonic with Sophie de Hosat, a noble woman who lived near him in Montgomery, he himself asserted the confessions that he led to write the book, A Desire for Loving, which I had never been able to satisfy and by which I felt myself devoured. Same previous experience of the love forbidden by the laws of class reflects Rousseau's own experience. And yet it cannot be said that the new Eloise is attacked on those laws, which seem on the contrary to be given the status almost of the laws of nature. The members of Wollemer household are depicted as finding happiness and living according to the aristocratical ideal, 
they appreciate the routines of the country life and enjoy the beauties of the Swiss and Severed Alps. But despite such an endorsement of the social order, the novel was revolutionary. It was free expression of emotions and extreme sensibility, deeply moved in the large readability and profoundly influenced literary developments. Emily is a book that seems to appeal alternatively to Republican ethic of the social contract and the aristocratic ethic of the new Eloise. It's also halfway between a novel and a dyadic essay. Described by the author as trees of an education, it's not by schooling, but by the upbringing of a rich man, it's by a tutor, who was given an unlimited authority over him. At the same time, the book sets out to explore possibilities of an education for Republican citizenship. The basic argument of the book, as Rousseau himself expressed, is bias and error, and which are alien to a child's original nature, are introduced by external agencies so that the work of a tutor must always be directed to counteracting those forces by manipulating pressures that will work with the nature and not against it. Rousseau devotes many pages to explaining the methods the tutor must use. These methods involve noticeable measure of deceit, and although corporal punishments forbidden, mental cruelty is not. Whereas social contract is concerned with the problems of achieving freedom, Emily is concerned with achieving happiness and wisdom. In different contexts, religion plays a different role. Instead of civil religion, Rousseau here outlines a personal religion, which proves to be a kind of simplified Christianity involving either revelation or the familiar dogmas of the church. In the guise of La Profession de Foy Vu Vache Savagard, 1765, The Profession of Faith of a Savagard of Vicar, Rousseau sets out that may be fairly regarded as his own religious views. Since that book confirms that he says on the subject of private correspondence, Rousseau can never entertain doubts about God's existence or about the immorality of the soul. He felt, moreover, a strong emotional drive toward the worship of God, whose presence he felt forcefully in nature, especially in the mountains and forests untouched by human hands. He both attached to the great importance of conscious and divine voice of the soul of man, in both his bloodest categories and rationalist ethics and to the cold tablets of biblical authority. The minimal creed that Rousseau, at the odds with the Orthodox, adherents of the churches and openly aesthetic policies of Paris, that despite the enthusiasm of his writings, especially the new Eloise, excited by the reading in public, he felt himself increasingly isolated, tormented, pursued. After he had been expelled from France, he chased Cantin de Cantin in Switzerland. He reacted to suppression of the social contract in Geneva by indicating the regime of the city-state mountain no longer as discourse in the origin of inequality was Geneva depicted as a model republic, but one that had been taken over 25 best points. The subjects of the King of England were said to be free by comparison by the victims of Genevan piracy. It was in England that Rousseau found refuge after he had been banished from the canton of Bern. The Scottish philosopher David Hume took him there and secured the offer a, pe a pension from King George III, but once England, Rousseau became aware of the certain British intellectuals were making fun of him, and he suspected human participating in mockery. Various symptoms of paranoia began to manifest themselves in Rousseau, and he returned to France incognito. Believing that Tresset was the only person he could rely on, he finally married her in 1768, and he was 56 years old. The last decade, in the remaining 10 years of his life, Rousseau produced primarily autobiographical writings, mostly intended to justify himself against the accusation of adversaries. The most important was Confessions modeled his work, the same title, St. Augustine, and achieving something the same time the classic status. He wrote Rousseau, Jug de Jean Jacques, 1780, Rousseau, Judge of Jean Jacques, to reply to specific charges, enemies, and les Rizab. From a Solitaire, 1782, Brazil Solitary Walker, one of the most moving of the books, in which intense passion of the earlier writings gives way to gentle lyricism and serenity. And indeed, Rousseau seems to have recovered a piece of the mind in the last year.
And indeed, Rousseau se does seem to have recovered from his peace of mind from last year's. He was again afforded refuge with the states of the great French noblemen, first the Prince de Conte and the Marquis de Carnian, whose park at Emeralds he died. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you next week for our next PowerPoint presentation. Now you know about Jean Jacos and you know about Emily and education. Have a great day. Bye.